welcome to the Michigan Man Podcast on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew for Wolverine fans from coast to coast. Go Blue and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Michigan Hoops is number six in the country, in first place, and ready for another big, big week. Our guest today is beat writer James Hawkins from the Detroit News. Before he joins us, let's get it started with a few of my thoughts. This has been another fun season watching John Beeline and his team. When the season started, I wasn't sure what we'd have with this team. I thought if we peaked in February or March, we could make it interesting in the Big Ten tournament and maybe even make it past the first weekend in the NCAAs. I must admit, I didn't see this coming. It's going to be a gut-wrenching, fingernail-biting home stretch of Michigan basketball. And the best part is, we have Sparty twice in the next three weeks, and those two meetings could very well decide who will be this year's Big Ten champion. And you can't ask for more than that. Beat writer James Hawkins from the Detroit News says, Michigan has what it takes to win the Big Ten and make a big run in the postseason. He thinks the key, though, will be Charles Matthews. He joins us next here on The Michigan Man on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew. Back with us on our game day segment this week to talk Michigan hoops is James Hawkins from the Detroit News. Great to have you with us again, James. Good to be back. Well, looking back at this uh, past weekend, there was a lot to like about that win on Saturday against Wisconsin. But at the top of the list for me, and I think for a lot of fans, would be the play of Charles Matthews. In one of your pieces uh, over the weekend, James, you mentioned it was the resurrection of Charles Matthews. And, you know, whatever it was, it really does have to continue, doesn't it? Yeah, I think when you look at Charles Matthews, I feel like when he's playing at that level he played at in that second half, I feel like when he's hitting those turnaround jumpers and exploding to the rim like he was, I feel like that's when he's at his best, and I feel like that's also when Michigan is at its best. I think he raises Michigan's ceiling. When he was going through those stretches where he was kind of that, that mid-range jumper, like wasn't falling for him for that one stretch um, earlier this Big Ten season, um, I feel like that kind of lowered Michigan's ceiling um, as a team and, and as an offense. Um, and it really reminded me, that that second half just reminded me of last season's NCAA tournament, which is what I, I, I wrote about, what you alluded to, um, just how well he was playing and how he really kind of carried Michigan throughout the, that postseason stretch where he was, you know, Michigan's top player. And that's what he looked like um, in, in that game against um, against Wisconsin in the second half. He just, I mean, that, that turnaround jump shot just looks unstoppable at times and, and and the biggest thing is like like I said he was exploding to the rim he was kind of backing his guy down or he was just driving it right at it and going up because I mean we've seen so many times where he'll he'll maybe start to drive and then he'll you know he'll just stop and he'll turn into those things where he starts pivoting and and turning and then he'll get called for travel or or he'll do those things where he'll go up to the rim but then he'll kind of hang and then you know it allows the defender to kind of jump up and catch up with him and make the, the shot more difficult but I feel like when Charles is playing at that level like he was playing at in that second half. I feel like that's that's going to be the key for Michigan. If they want to make a long postseason run again, Charles Matthews has to kind of play at that level and play like he was um, against Wisconsin in that second half. No, I absolutely agree with you. I know we talk from time to time during the season about Michigan, you know, not having the man. A lot of teams have the man. Maybe that's important. Maybe it's not. But the offense does play at a different level when Charles is playing with that confidence and uh, making decisions, it doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, it also matched the fact, I mean, look at what Ignis Prosdekis did. I mean, he really didn't do anything in that game. I mean, maybe Wisconsin just has his number, but I mean, when Charles is able to, like I said, when he's able to explode to the rim, it's able to break down the defense, it's able to open up so many things for so many other people. Um, I mean, we know that Charles can, you know, get to the rim at will if he wants to. It's just a matter of him doing it. Um, I mean, the same thing with Ignis Brasdakis. I mean, they have these guys that can flash and attack, and when you get guys that can do that, I mean, I mean, Wisconsin coach Greg Gard alluded to it when Charles, you know, was able to get these 
these first few baskets like he was around the rim. I mean, that gets his confidence going in those those final two shots he hit in like the last 90 seconds. I mean, those were not easy shots. I mean, he hit the one baseline fadeaway jumper and then the the dagger shot he hit, which was probably the hardest shot. I mean, that fall away um, from the free throw line that beat the, beat the shot clock. I mean, that drove the dagger into it, but that's also, I mean, when, when Charles Matthews hit those types of shots, it's almost, like I said, it's almost unstoppable. It's like you can't do much as a defense to really stop that shot. Um, but yeah, but when he's just, when he's aggressive, when he's, picking his spots and driving to the rim, it just opens up so much other things for the, for the rest of the team. It opens up, you know, more three point shots because you got the defense collapsing. Um, and then, and like I said, it gets, it gets Charles more confident in that. And I mean, we've seen, like we, like I said, I mean, you see what happens when you get a Charles, uh, a confident Charles Matthews. I mean, you get, you get that, um, that version that kind of stood out throughout the entire um, NCAA tournament run last season. Well, you mentioned Iggy uh, Varazdakis. I don't think he wants to see uh, Wisconsin again. Coach B said he doesn't want to see Wisconsin and Ethan Happ again, but uh, he, he struggled again. But are there any concerns at this point that Iggy might be hitting that wall that, you know, freshmen sometimes hit in February? No, I don't think so. I mean, if you if you look at the, the game before that, I mean, at, at Rutgers, I mean, he kind of, you know, took, took that game over and he poured in like, what, 20, 23 points, something like that. I think mm-hmm. the thing with Iggy, it just seems like, you can almost kind of tell when he's going to have a good game and when he's not. It just seems like you can just gauge his early his early shots. It seems like if he's hitting his first few shots, you can almost get a sense like okay, he's gonna he's probably gonna pour in you know maybe like fifteen to twenty points or something like that. And then and then he has games where he can't really he he can't really hit. I mean, in the, in the game against Wisconsin, it seemed like they tried to dial him up early to get him going, and he missed you know his first two shots. And it kind of just kind of set the tone for the rest of the game for him where he just wasn't really able to get anything to fall. And like I said, the game against Rutgers, I think he hit his first two three-pointers, and then it was kind of one of those things where like, okay, well, he's going to get going, and he kind of did. So I don't know. Maybe it just seems like that's that's been the case going on. It's like if he's – you can kind of get a sense early on if he's going to have one of those games, if he's kind of off the mark early, it seems like maybe going to set the tone for the rest of the game. But I'm not – I wouldn't worry too much about maybe hitting a freshman wall. I think – I think it could just be the whole just Wisconsin having his number. And he also did have Ethan Happ guarding him. And that's, you know, a guy that probably has a couple more inches and a few more pounds on him. So it was probably just a difficult, um, def- like matchup for him, um, to, to go up against. But, no, um, I, I'm, for me, I'm not really too concerned about him hitting a wall. Um, I just think it was, I just think that Wisconsin team is just a, a tough matchup like they are for a lot of teams. And I think, that's just, you know, something that led to Iggy struggles in those two matchups. Well, the other big performance on Saturday came from John Teske, and I'm talking about on the offensive end, James. He is just really gaining confidence, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, that's 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 another key for Michigan moving forward. I mean, you got to have you got to have um uh Teske playing at the level he is on on offense. I mean, we know the impact he makes on defense, but I mean, if you're able to get this consistently on him out of him on offense, I mean, especially in in pick and roll situations and him around the rim. I mean, that does so much. It opens up the offense so much. I mean, I feel like when Michigan's offense is at its best, I mean, we saw kind of when they had the home game at Northwestern, when you have, when you have Teske hitting perimeter shots, when you have Xavier Simpson hitting perimeter shots, that opens up so much for this offense and it's almost unstoppable. You can't really do anything to stop any of these guys. You have all these guys hitting their perimeter shots. Um, but yeah, obviously we know the impact John Teske makes on defense, but when he's, when he's able to, you know, chip in, you know, 10, 12 points on offense. I mean, that makes, that makes a, a world of difference for this, for this team, obviously. And it also helps mask, you know, like I said, when you have other guys that aren't having down, kind of having down games like uh, Iggy was against Wisconsin. I mean, Teske's more than capable of, you know, kind of picking up the slack, slack and shouldering the load um, on offense. You know, another player that sort of, uh, I wouldn't say struggle. I don't want to say that, but he's been a bit on and off the last couple of weeks is Jordan Poole. Do you think that's primarily because of the extra defensive attention he's getting? Yeah, I mean he is he is a marked man. I mean he had that he had a stretch for over a month where he was kind of Michigan's top guy. I mean he was scoring at an abs- crazy pace. I think he was averaging almost like sixteen, seventeen points over like a month stretch, and he was really the standout guy on the offensive end. And I mean, yeah, that's going to happen. I mean he's kind of a, a marked man now. I mean he's probably one of the top top guys on every defensive team scouting report and. You can just see how he's being defended. He's, I mean, he was being face guarded at times where he hasn't been face guarded at all, you know, throughout freshman year early on this season. 
Um, he has guys picking him up a lot further out on the on the perimeter. Um, and I think also some of it is too is some of the shots he's taking. I mean, Coach John Beeline kind of harps on that he he shoots from NBA distance when he <laughs> shoots much better from close to the line. And I think you could look at there was multiple multiple times in the game against Wisconsin where he was open and he could have you know taken a dribble and stepped into it and gotten close to the line and said he shot from a few feet behind the line and granted I think he made one of those but I think the other, the a couple other ones he took from well beyond the line um he missed so I think that is part of it I think you know maybe he's just making things harder on himself by shooting from further away and but I mean we all know he can hit that shot um but I think that's just the biggest thing for him is I mean we know he's Michigan's top three point threat um to just get closer to the line because John Beeline talked about his numbers. They're much better. I think he said it's, he's almost shooting like 45% from the college line, and I think it's like 33% from the NBA line. Yeah. So I feel like if he's just able to make that play adjustment, I mean, I think that'll make a world of difference. But I think it is um, him just kind of adjusting and adapting to um, this increased defensive attention that he, he has been receiving. And, I mean, it is – it's just going to kind of go um, – just kind of how the matchup is in a, in a game and just how they're able to adjust – in a game to kind of get him open and get him going on the offensive end. James, every week I like Xavier Simpson and what he gives this team more and more. And I know the, fan, the fans debate, and we all talk about who the man is on this team. Um, it's great that Charles Matthews hopefully is going to uh, get into sync now. But for my money, game to game, Xavier is the straw that stirs the drink. Or is that just giving him too much credit? No, I mean, he is. I mean, that's the funny thing about this team. I mean, I think we might have talked about this earlier, but if you can, I mean, you can make a case, for, honestly, for anybody, like anybody on the starting five to be this team's MVP so far this season. Um, but yeah, I mean, definitely Xavier. I mean, the thing is, like, it's kind of like teams know the, the scouting report on him, too. I mean, you know, teams will dare him to shoot from the perimeter and all this stuff, but he still is able to get to the rim that will a lot of times. He's blow by his defender and get to the rim. Um, but I mean, even when his offense is, his offense isn't really, you know, clicking and he, may, he maybe isn't hitting those shots. I mean, he does so many other things so well um, that it kind of makes up for all that. I mean, the game at Rutgers, I mean, his some of the passes he was making were absurd. I remember the, the first, the one pass he made to, to Iggy, he had a, like a left-handed wraparound bounce pass on the baseline to Iggy um, in a corner for, for an open three. I mean, just the things he's able to do and the way he's able to find teammates and, I mean, he rarely, I mean, his – Assist the turnover ratio. I think he leads the Big Ten in that in that category. Um, knowing he's able just to kind of see the floor so much better and kind of find find teammates. I mean that makes a huge difference in getting you know guys open shots and getting the offense kind of going. Um, I mean yeah, there are going to be games where he can. I mean he's shown that he can score. You know, um, in the double digits in games. I mean he's led the team in scoring a few times so far this season. But I think the thing with him is like he's he's not. That's not what you know he doesn't have to do. I mean he can do it. But I mean when you have the three-headed scoring attack of, you know, Jordan Poole, Charles Matthews, and um, Iggy, Iggy Prasvakis. I mean, he really doesn't have to do that. Um, I feel like it's more so just him, you know, running the offense and getting guys open looks and, you know, kind of just nicing his way through the defenses and uh, finding the open guy. I feel like that's what he does best. But like I said earlier, with when we were talking about Tesca, I mean, when Xavier Simpson is hitting those perimeter shots and knocking down those threes, I mean, I feel like that opens up so much, you know, other looks for the rest of the team, and that just makes – this Michigan team that much harder to defend when he kind of has, has that going for him. Well, this offense just seems to find a way every week. It's someone, you know, jumping up to be the man. It's uh, not every, when someone's off, someone else is on, they pick up the slack. But at this point, do you think the offense can be better with seven games left? Or at this point, is it just what it is? Uh, I feel like the offense kind of is what it is, I guess, at this point. I mean, we've seen flashes of what it can be i mean like i said when they had that home game at, at northwestern where they had everybody hitting um i mean they had you know xavier simpson and john teske hitting shots from outside and they kind of opened everything up i mean we've seen flashes of how good it can be um i just don't think i mean you're, it seems like every every game you're going to maybe have two guys that two guys in the starting lineup that maybe aren't having great games and i mean that's what makes this team so good though is that they can have the other guys kind of pick up the slack and they can carry the team I mean, there there have been games where it's been a balanced scoring attack where it seems like they've had, you know, four close to five guys scoring in double digits. I mean, I feel like that's when Michigan is at its best. But, I mean, you're just going to – just how hard it is against, you know, other Big Ten teams and the scouting reports that they have. 
um, I mean, it's just you're just going to have games where it's just going to be, you know, a couple guys are going to maybe not have good games, but every game for Michigan, I mean, it's almost like you can have two guys that can step up and really shoulder the load and carry this team. That's what makes them so good. But I think the thing for them to avoid is just to have, you know, if you have, you know, three three guys having bad games where, you know, they may be having games kind of like Iggy had against Wisconsin, where, you know, they're having like, you know, one for nine showings and one for seven showings. Um, I feel like that's when they're more susceptible to kind of dropping a game. I think that's kind of, you know, what happened in the game at Iowa. Didn't Like not many guys really had, you know, kind of good games. A few guys kind of struggled. And, I mean, that's kind of what led to that. I mean, also there was foul trouble in that game too. But I feel like as long as they're able to avoid, you know, three or four of the starters kind of having rough games at the same time, um, I feel like, you know, the offense is able to do enough no matter who they're facing if, if, as long as, you know, they have, you know, three guys kind of a, kind of carrying the load on offense. Well, I think you're right about that. And I th- most of us worry about the offense, it seems, every game. But the defense, you know, I don't even know what to say at this point other than after 24 games, this might be, might be the best defensive team I've seen at Michigan. It is just that good, isn't it, James? Yeah, I mean, this is only my, my third season covering the teams, but by far this is the best defensive team um, that Michigan has had in, in the years I've been covering covering this team. And, I mean, a lot of it is. I mean, you can you can just point to the middle. I mean, John Teske, I think we all know Mo Wagner. He, he had an offensive skill set unlike many big men in the – in the nation, but just the difference that John Teske makes at anchoring the defense in the middle of the paint, um, it makes a world of difference for this team. I mean, obviously they they have two guys who should be all Big Ten defenders and Charles Matthews and Xavier Simpson. I mean, they can lock down and shut down any guy. And Jordan Poole, he actually plays pretty, pretty solid defense. I mean, you wouldn't have maybe expected that given the way he played defense last season. Um, but they really don't have a, a weak link in their starting five when it comes – to defense and um Iggy Vardakis, I mean he he'll take on guys much you know much bigger his size and I mean he he can kind of hold his own too I mean he's kind of a another physical guy that you know doesn't shy away from contact or you know kind of taking on guys um down in the paint and banging with the bigger bodies um but yeah their defense is just so so connected so sound um and a lot of it starts with as we talked about Xavier Simpson you know kind of disrupting defenses and getting out at them at the point of attack but um it's just kind of a, a mentality that this team all has. I mean, they all take pride in their defense. Um, and I mean, that's kind of that's kind of contagious when you have all you know a mindset like that, and you have guys that kind of look forward to their defensive matchups um, each each and every game. And um, but I just think the biggest difference, I mean, if you want to look at this team this year from last year, I think the biggest difference just on deep on defense is just the difference, and you know. The, what John Teske can do to alter shots and change shots without even maybe blocking shots is really makes an impact and makes a, a world of difference for this team. He leads the Big Ten in shot blocks right now. Is that right? Yeah, I think he's averaging like 2.2 a game or something like that. But yeah, he is the, uh, the leading shot blocker in the Big Ten so far. Yep. Well, there are some huge games left on the schedule, but Saturday's win cannot be understated. Beating Wisconsin and the way that Michigan beat them, that was just big-time impressive, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I mean, you have the your team's leading scorer only scores you know, what was it, two points I think mm-hmm. he had? I mm-hmm. mean, and, you, and you're still able to win by, you know, nine points. And, um, I mean, it was – the funny thing about that game is it was almost like a, a carbon copy of the game that, that played out in Madison. It was kind of nip and tuck. No team could really get much separation from one another throughout the game until the final few minutes when, you know, kind of Charles Matthews took over down the stretch and kind of helped put that game away. But, I mean, yeah, I mean, Wisconsin is – I mean – they were one of the hottest teams in the Big Ten coming into that. I mean, they had six wins. Um, I mean, Coach Tom Young said they were playing as well as anybody in the nation. And, I mean, Wisconsin's always a, a tough out. I mean, even if you look at the success they had in Ann Arbor, I think they won like seven of the ten, the seven of the last ten meetings in Ann Arbor. Um, I mean, they're a team that's always been kind of a thorn in Michigan's side. But, but, yeah, I mean, Michigan, I mean, that is a huge win just in terms of just in the Big Ten, when you look at the Big Ten race, I mean, you have to defend home. If you if you want to have a chance to win the the regular season title, I mean Michigan has done a good job of that, and they did the, they did the job Saturday, and they were able to. I mean, if they would have dropped that game, that would have just. I mean, Wisconsin would have pulled even with them in the standings, and that would have just really bunched up the the standings here with seven games to go. But I mean, that win 
was big in, in, for, in several areas. I mean, you can say it was a revenge win, I mean, avenging their first loss, but I mean, it also kind of gave them this game lead in the Big Ten standings. And, um, yeah, I mean, it really, like I said, if they were to, if they were to drop that game, that would have kind of just made things uh, much more difficult in this race because, as we know, Michigan's kind of schedule here down the stretch, I mean, isn't – isn't the easiest uh, easiest test to have in these in these final closing seven games coming mm. up? No, no, it is not. And, uh, yes, Saturday's win big because uh, yes, you beat Wisconsin, you protected uh, home court. Michigan is four and two on the road so far this year, which is pretty good. Uh, it heads to Penn State Tuesday night. Penn State, you know, they're on, they're off, uh, but it's on the road. It's going to be another big test. Yeah, I mean, we know Penn State obviously is like they're at the bottom of the Big Ten standings, but I mean, it's one of those. You can't really take any game lately. I've I've really stopped trying to figure out the Big Ten this season. I mean, you can look at what happened at Iowa the other night. I mean, Northwestern was up 15 points with like 4:30 to go, and then Iowa finds a way to come back. Um, and I mean, Penn State too. I mean, they, I mean, Purdue had to go to overtime to to pull out the game there, and Purdue's probably you know, what they won eight straight, and they're they're kind of right there at the top of the the Big Ten standings. And um, I mean, yeah, it's one of these things. I mean, you go. I mean, you just you think it's going to be an easy win, but it's not. I mean, you gotta. I mean, you gotta play the game. So, I mean, you got a, a desperate team. You know, Penn State is, and I mean, it's never a good thing. I mean, I don't think Michigan's going to overlook them. Um, but yeah, it's just. I mean, like I said, I've really kind of stopped trying to figure out the Big Ten this season. I mean, it really doesn't seem to make sense. I mean, it just shows how how good it is, I guess, in a sense. I mean, how deep it is, just because. It just seems like on any given night, any given team is able to beat anybody. I mean, even if you look at teams at the bottom of the standings, I mean, everybody's a threat on any any given night. So, but I, like I said, I don't think Michigan's gonna gonna overlook them. But it's definitely a a game. If you kind of look at the rest of the games that Michigan Michigan has, um, this is a a road game that Michigan should should pick up. Just because I mean, I think if you really want a chance at winning the Big Ten title, you gotta you're gonna have to defend home, but then you're also gonna have to win at least half your road games. And like you said, I mean, win at Penn State, I think would give Michigan their fourth or fifth, be fifth. win in the Big Ten on the road. And fifth win. Yeah, so, so I mean, I, yeah, I think that's it's a big game in several areas. So I don't, but like I said, I don't think it's a game that Michigan isn't going to gonna overlook. And I think they're going to, you know, really come out um, ready to pick up that win on Tuesday. Well, getting that road win would be huge. But then Saturday you turn around, Maryland comes calling to Chrysler, and they are a very talented young team playing pretty darn well right now, aren't they, James? Yeah, they were They were kind of making that push there to, towards the top of the standings, and they kind of they kind of stumbled a little bit, but they, they still have one of the better, I guess, front court tandems in the league. I mean, they have Bruno Fernando and Jalen Smith. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really going to be an interesting test for Michigan when they get there because, um, I mean, that's one of those games where you feel like if – you know, John Teske gets in foul trouble. Um, that could be a, you know, anything's possible of happening. We've seen what happens with this team when John Teske gets in foul trouble. I mean, um, they really don't have that that backup big five spot. It's kind of just been, you know, um, a glaring weakness, I guess, for this team all season long. It really hasn't solidified still. So um, I think that looking at that, um, that's probably going to be the biggest key for Michigan in that game is, keeping Teske out of foul trouble, just like it was a game against Wisconsin. I mean, that was maybe an underrated aspect of the game is John Teske wasn't in foul trouble, and he was able to stay in the game all game against Ethan Happ. Um, I feel like that's going to be kind of a similar key with uh, the game against Maryland is keeping John Teske out of foul trouble because, I mean, if you have to dive into the bench and try to guard a guy like Bruno Fernando and the talent he has, I mean, that's going to be a, uh, a tough task for, you know, if that's, whether that's Brandon Johns, whether that's Austin Davis, whether that's Isaiah Livers. Um, but yeah, I mean, Maryland's one of these teams that's still in the hunt, um, kind of this down in this final stretch. And that's, I mean, these are games, I think this week in general is just big. I mean, if Michigan's going to want to, I mean, if they're going to want to have a chance to really finish the season at the top of the Big Ten standings, I mean, these are two games they're definitely going to have to pick up. I mean, it's a winnable road game and a game at, a game at home you're going to have to, where you're going to have to defend home court. So I think, you know, this is kind of a, a really a big week for Michigan, I mean, to kind of, you know, help its case and aid its case. Um, and kind of maintaining its lead atop the Big Ten standings. What is the biggest concern area you see for this team the rest of the way? I think it's it's still it's, it's depth. I mean, they really don't have much you know reliable depth on the bench. I mean, Isaiah Livers. I mean, outside of Isaiah Livers in their top six, I mean, you really don't know what what the rest of the guys are going to give you on any given night. I mean, when's the last time Eli Brooks even scored? I mean, I can't even remember. Um, it's yeah, it's I feel like we've seen 
like I said, I mean, at Iowa when they got in foul trouble, I mean, it just the lack of depth that they have at and at the five spot in particular has just kind of been just a troublesome spot for this team. And I mean, at Iowa they got outscored, the bench got outscored twenty one to three, and that was kind of the big difference in the game. But yeah, I just feel like that's the the thing. I mean, if they get in foul trouble and if John John Teske in particular has to go to the bench, we've seen what can happen. I mean, Iowa went on that twenty one to two run to kind of take control of the game when Teske was on the bench, and then I mean, if you, you can go all the way back to the game at Northwestern when. Teske was on the bench in foul trouble, and that was when the Wildcats went on those runs to kind of make that game close um, and kind of threaten throughout that game. Um, so yeah, I think their lack of depth is kind of their biggest concern. So as long as guys are able to stay out of foul trouble, um, I feel like you know they're able to take care of business. But, I mean, the lack of depth, particularly at the five spot, has kind of been still this the glaring weakness for this team. And I feel like you know other Big Ten teams kind of probably realize that, and that's maybe why – Teams going forward might try to go right at Teske and kind of pick up that first foul to get him on the bench. Um, I mean, that's what Iowa, several of the guys alluded to um, after that game. They said they know, you know, the difference he makes for the team, and that's why they're going right at him to try to get him out of the game. And I feel like, you know, that's what teams might do moving forward, and I think that's kind of the biggest concern for Michigan is that they don't have, don't have this, you know, this reliable depth that can come in um, outside of outside of the top six. You know, Eli Brooks does. Coach Ben will allude to his defensive numbers, and he does do things well on um, the defense. And then, but I, like I said, I just can't remember the last time he even made a shot on offense and made a difference on offense. Um, but I mean, Michigan's proven all season long they can win with you know the seven man rotation or just you know relying on six guys to score. So I mean, if it's not if it's not broke, you don't got to fix it, I guess. But um, I feel like it's just kind of been the same weak weak spot that they've had all season, and I don't really think much is going to change unless you know, all of a sudden Brandon Johns or someone just kind of breaks out and steps up and kind of just takes control um, down the stretch. But that could happen. Um, will it happen? I mean, I really don't think it will. So it's really just more so I think on the, you know, the top six guys just kind of staying out of foul trouble um, is really, I mean, the best case for Michigan here moving forward on the stretch. You know, Isaiah Livers, I thought we'd be getting a little more from him uh, down the stretch. But, you know, when I watch him lately, he missed a, a dunk, um, um, not against Wisconsin, but the other night last week. He's missed a couple of dunks where he comes down. He looks a little awkward or a little gimpy. Is that ankle injury still lingering? Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, he kind of, I mean, I remember last season when he suffered the ankle injury at Northwestern and he came back, he missed one game and he came back. Um he said he really wasn't himself. He didn't really look like himself the rest of that season. Um, so it's kind of hard. We haven't really gotten him, like, in terms of availability of postgame too too much, so we really, have, really haven't had a chance to ask. But, I mean, he – I don't know. I mean, it, it could be lingering. I mean, I don't I don't really think it is. I just think – I think the biggest thing with him is just – the one thing he talked about is, like, he, he was going to be more aggressive heading into the season on offense. He was going to be, you know, taking it to the rim and, and driving more and – he said, I mean, he did, he has, he's, he's had flashes of that, but he really still hasn't been, you know, this, this aggressive player that's really, you know, just driving to the rim and taking it to the rim. I think he had one take against Wisconsin, I think he did, where he drove to the rim. Um, but more so, it's, it still feels like with him, a lot of his shots are just still coming from out on the perimeter, mm-hmm. um, just kind of standing out, out there and just putting up threes. And I mean, he is, he, he still is a good three-point shooter. I mean, you still want him taking those open looks, but. I, I just don't think he's been that aggressive player that he wanted to be and he said he was going to be. Um, I really don't think that's really come to fruition this season. Maybe that is the ankle. I don't, I don't know. I feel like I don't really think that's been um, hampering this season because, I mean, like you, you mentioned these dunks. I mean, yeah, I mean, that was kind of an explosive move to the rim and the Thunder's dunk he missed. I mean, that was the second big dunk I think he tried to throw down over a guy and he missed. Um, it, it could be lingering. I mean, it just seems like he's always kind of been dinged up a little bit. Um, both his seasons. Um, but I just think with him, it's just, I don't know. I just, my biggest concern with him, like I said, is just, I don't think he's being as aggressive on offense as, as it can be um, this season. Well, final question for you, James. Uh, of course we have uh, the seven games left as of this week, two of those are against the Spartans and yes, they are reeling right now. They being the Spartans, but they will be a little bit more than motivated for those two games with Michigan. We know that. Do you think the Big Ten championship will still be decided by the outcome of those two games? I think it'll certainly go a long way because, I mean, like I said, Purdue is, I mean, Michigan has a one-game lead on Purdue right here, um, but they also have played one more game than Purdue. Um, and 
I mean, several people have talked about, you know, Purdue having uh, probably the easiest uh, schedule the rest of the way. Um, I mean, those are definitely going to go a long way. Um, I, I still, I'm kind of back and forth. I still think the Big Ten title will be decided before that last game in East Lansing. Um, but yeah, I think, I, I, I honestly think they're going to end up splitting these, splitting these games. So I think they'll decide they'll give each team a loss moving forward. But I mean, I don't, I don't think Purdue's going to run the table going forward. Um, I don't know, I feel like if Michigan, as long as I feel like if Michigan can get to 15 and five in by the end of the season and kind of the big 10 play, I think that they'll give them a really good shot at winning the Big Ten title because, like I said, I think Purdue has the easiest road. But I mean, like I said, they almost lost at Penn State on the road, and I mean, Penn State is by record they're the worst team in the Big Ten. Um, so I mean, they, I mean, they're any any team is capable of dropping you know a game against uh, any team in any given night in this league. But um, those are definitely going to be two key games. But I think the first meeting with the game in Ann Arbor um, against Michigan State, I feel like that's a game Michigan. Ha- has to win, um, and I think they probably will win. I think they're gonna each team's gonna win in their arenas this season. But I feel like as long as Michigan is able to to split, I feel like that will still help their case in winning the Big Ten. I feel like if Michigan drops both those games against the Spartans, I feel like then I don't think they will um, win the title. But I feel like as long as they're able to split those two, um, I think that will help them kind of pull out and and. Uh, I win the title this season. Cause like I said, I think it will be decided before that, that final meeting, any thing. But I mean, if it does come down to that, I feel like that would make, you know, that rivalry matchup that much more highly anticipated and uh, look forward to, um, to have that on the line. Um, I just don't think that will be the case though. Truly every game is big this week uh, on the road, as we've said against Penn state and back home for uh, Maryland on, um, on Sunday or Saturday. So a huge week. Our guest today on the show uh, on our game day segment has been beat writer James Hawkins from the Detroit News. We'll get you back here in the coming weeks, and it should be uh, scintillating at the end of the month. It's a buckle up. It's going to be a a wild finish. James, thank you so much for taking the time, and uh, we'll get you back on here in a couple weeks then, okay? All right, sounds good. My pleasure, Mike. Quick hits is next as we wrap it up for another week here on The Michigan Man on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V Sporto Network, and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew. On Quick Hits today, Coach Barnes Arico and her team are red hot and riding a four game winning streak. We beat Penn State on Sunday, 66 62. Thursday, Indiana pays a visit to Chrysler. Then on Sunday, it's on the road to Illinois. Michigan is 16-9 and nine overall, 7-6 and six in the Big Ten. Hockey swept Sparty in a weekend series for the first time since 2016, winning at Yost on Friday, and then 5-2 on Saturday night in the Battle of the D at Little Caesars Arena in Detroit. Tonight, we're on the road against Notre Dame in South Bend, and then back home for a big weekend series with Ohio State. We are 12-11-6 and six overall, 8-7-4 and four in Big Ten play. Softball got the season underway down in Tampa at the Wilson D. Marini Tournament last weekend, going 3-2. and two. The only losses were to top 10 teams Arizona and Florida. This weekend, it's the Big Ten ACC Challenge. It's a doubleheader on Friday with Louisville and North Carolina, a single game on Saturday with the Tar Heels, and we close it out on Sunday with Louisville. Don't forget our free show app is available from the iTunes and Google Play stores. You can also hear us on iHeart, Stitcher, Spotify, and Wolverine Sports Radio. That will do it for another week. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Until we meet again next week, have a great Wolverine week, everyone. Take care, and as always, go blue. Thanks for joining us today on The Michigan Man here on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew. Our listener lines are open 24-7 for your calls at 313-263-4842. That's 313-263-4842. Or email us at the Michigan Man Podcast at Yahoo.com. That's the Michigan Man Podcast at Yahoo.com. 
The Michigan Man podcast is produced at the studios of Robin Lynn Productions, Allen Park, Michigan, and is not affiliated with the University of Michigan. Go Blue!